well. How are you? Kevin Smith. How are you, sir? So this is our snowball, our microphone. Here's the camera right here. This is awesome. Yeah, and then um, wow. basically the Google Plus Hangout. Yes. We get to hang out with anywhere from five to ten people maximum in the Hangout room. Okay. But there are now more than a hundred million users on Google Plus. Of course. So we have the on-air uh, broadcast, so we are potentially broadcasting to right. hundred million lots of recordings. Potentially, but you ain't hitting them, that's for sure. Well, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> I, do not. I don't care. Oddly enough, I don't carry my book around with me. Whenever I go someplace, Maybe they usually hand right me a up? copy. No, no. no, no we don't. Know. We're by the time you guys see it, uh -huh. we're so sick of it that we don't want to see okay. it anymore. Okay, all right. We won't talk about it. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the book from now until the other time. I, I'm kidding. Oh, so this is the, the hangout. You've got a lot of fans in the hangout right now. Let me introduce you to some of the people. We have Jeff, who is hanging out from the Bay Area. Hey, man. Jeff. Hola. Yeah, this is amazing. This, this is, is what television should always be like. This is the idea of, like, for years people watch TV. Thank you. And now the idea that TV it's watches back. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Do you know how many shows would be canceled you. like that? Well, or well, how many I shows would be saved as well, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's how we like to look at Instant it. Instant feedback. Justin's in the UK. Hey, man. Kempton's Hi. in Canada. Right on. And Kim Hi. is actually in Singapore right now. Uh, don't throw your gum out, dude. But she's originally. Hey, <laughs> yeah, <don't throw> <laughs> I tried to. <laughs> Kim tried to get me to. Oh, she's in St. Louis. Throw your gum all over his joint in St. Louis, man. We got no luck. We got Robert. Robert, we haven't seen you in a while. He's coming out from uh, Mexico. 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 Oh my gosh, I can't believe it, Robert. Maryland? No, yes. Rhode Island, the little state. Oh, okay. We're northeast. The round state. Yes. Yeah. Um, Stephen is up in Canada. Stephen, hello. And what part of Canada? Tom, we'll never find out. Tom here. is, and I'll tell you, Tom is in Atlanta, right? Hey, man. Atlanta. Hey, bud. What's up? So, you guys, I'm going to open it up to the Hangout. First of all, congrats on your book. Thank you. Um, very popular, of course. Tough. Uh, we say Smith. It's the internet. Oh, you can't curse. I know, but you, you know. Can I, mean, I think? Go ahead. Yeah. 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 This is the one place yeah. we can actually. Say e exactly. <laughs> okay, so who's got the first question for Kevin? Who wants to, to start? Question. Yes. So, go ahead, Robert. Two-parter. Uh, first part is um, any good protests you've been to lately, particularly with respect to your own work. No, uh, not <laughs> since the. Dogma protest, uh, heady days of the dogma protest have I gone out and protested my own work. But the last sit-in or whatever I went to was Occupy Wall Street a couple months back. We brought a stack of pizzas and went and checked it out and whatnot. Uh, and, and they, boy, they built a little community there. I mean, mm -hmm. they've since kind it of is, taken yeah. it down, I believe. Or I don't know if it, did they take They're it down? They're still small. Smaller group, but they, they kind of made it just because it became yeah. its own sprawling Huge. little metropolis, <laughs> kind of like a Coachella. <laughs> Uh, but that was the last one I went to. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, I wasn't actively taking part. I was giving out pizza. And I certainly backed the message. It's always weird going to the, uh, you know, the, to an Occupy movement because they're like, damn, the 1%. You're like, yeah, the F the 1%. And you're like, oh, I am the 1%. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Hold it. <laughs> Leave me alone. I brought pizza. Yeah, totally. Look at this, man. Okay. Who's next? Uh, I am a, a, a big fan, and I, I have to tell you, I was reading uh, Wikipedia, and it talked about the spider yeah. and Wild Wild West. Yes. There was, uh, there was, at one point, uh, I was working on Superman, and John Peters, the producer, wanted to include a giant spider in the third act uh, big in a big, bad way. He's like, Superman's got a... Quite a spider. He had this King Kong thing going on in his head where he's like, remember King Kong with the doors open and you finally see King Kong for the first time? He's like, that's what I want for this giant spider and he's got Superman's got a fight and stuff. So I was like, all right, and put it in there and put the fight in. And uh, thankfully, that movie never got made and that scene never saw the light of day. But John Peters produced a movie called uh, Wild Wild West mm -hmm. years later. And as I was sitting in the audience watching that movie, man, sure enough, in the third act, a giant mechanical spider comes out, you know, and you're just like, oh, my God, that guy got his spider. He wanted it so bad. <laughs> he got it in the right movie. Yeah. Wasn't that a really expensive yeah. flop? Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. That was my nickname in high school, by the way. Very expensive listen, flop. You've been talking about <laughs> retiring from the movies. I mean, is that is that true? Yes. For real? Heaven's <gasps> getting out. What yeah. do you uh, I guess uh, there's so many other things that I enjoy doing oh. more now. And also, when I, when I say, like, I mean literally retiring from directing movies, the going movie theaters, that all rigmarole. That leaves you the Internet to play on. I can make stuff there. I can make stuff on TV. we got that show, okay. Comic Book right. Men. So there's something. So I'm not, like, retiring and okay. going to the woods or something. I'm just going to oh, stop. Oh, he can hang out. Yeah. 
Gotcha. On hey, that, you can hear you. Uh, you're just, it's just it's a ridiculous and... it's a ridiculously expensive uh, process for for an artist, and I do kind of like to consider myself an artist. So unfortunately, I wish I had the ability to express myself differently, and I do that now through podcasting. But predominantly, my art form was film, and film is not like painting. If I was a painter, I'd show you canvas, slap some color on it, and you'd know how I felt inside. If I was a singer, I'd open my mouth. I can emote and you'd know how I was feeling, but I'm, I'm a filmmaker, which means I'm the only artist in the Pantheon It's like, I need to self-express, give me $20 million in Ben Affleck now, you know, so that's <laughs> a large process for somebody that, like, is just a storyteller. I just want to tell stories, so I could do that easily if I jump in front of a laptop. I don't even have to plug it. I keep doing this like I'm mm -hmm. sucking the dick. Uh, I don't even have to plug it. I <laughs> somebody online. Like, what are you making that hand quick? Uh, you, don't to, you don't have to uh, get people schedules. You don't have to ask people like, hey man, can you make some time for this sort of thing or anything like that. You you just kind of go at it with your own. Like think about Red State. Four years ago, I wrote Red State. It took me a long time to to have that conversation with the audience. Like we did it, and then. I wrote it, and it took a long time before I could find money, find the cast to put together, find the time to shoot it. All those elements went up. Podcast, it was just a podcast. I could have sat down on my laptop with someone else, recorded it over the course of an hour, two hours, whatever, put it up online, and I'm done. And then tomorrow, I can do something completely different. And for somebody that just wants to story tell, the idea of doing it frequently, instead of like, hey, man, we do one every other year, one of these big-ass movies. I mean, think about it. It's like making one massive bet. That's like going to Vegas for the weekend. And going like, I'm just going to make one bet, man, but it's going to be for $10,000. Why not spread that out, man? Make a bunch of $20 bets, $100 bets. Here, try it all. In a world where, like, somebody opens up doors for you, like clerks open up doors for me, you get to try other things. And, and I'm... Don't make it great. Don't get yeah, me wrong. Yeah, luckily it's gotten you to this place. Yeah, you can, you can try other stuff. Right, like, right. And, and the stuff that I like more is the stuff that is going to come out way better. Like, whatever I'm passionate about is the stuff that's going to play far better. And, and right now I'm not nearly passionate about film like I was back in the day because I've done it a, a bunch, almost 20 years now. And it's great and I love it, but there are other ways that I could kind of express myself far more economical, make mm -hmm. more uh, sense for my strengths. I'm not a visual storyteller. It took me nearly 20 years to figure out how to shoot a movie. If you look, at, if you look at the movies, man, you look at Clerks, doesn't look very good. Sta shot very static uh, cameras. Mallrats uh, looks like it was shot by somebody who was partially blind, <laughs> maybe legally blind or something like that. <laughs> Chasing Amy looks, you know, uh, like a combination of the two, and and also, but still, I I put people against walls and shoot them, so there's no depth whatsoever. It's not until I start doing Dogma that we start getting into right. depth. Jane Silent Bob Strike Back actually starts to look pretty good, but nobody talks about the look of it because it's like, you know, Jane Silent Bob Strike Back. Uh, by the time I get to, like, Jersey Girl and, and the rest, even though I, I think they look good, like, finally I'm learning how to tell a story, but unfortunately I'm running out of interesting things to say cinematically because that process is so long, and it's always kind of, you're chiseled at, left and right. They always want you to keep it up just a little bit. Even if you go to some place like the hollowed halls of Miramax back in the 90s, they always want you to sheep it up because that's what sells. Like, do something that someone else did. Why don't you do it more like this because this movie made money and stuff like that. And the individuality is your currency, man. That's your currency. That's what you carry through life. You, your experiences, your perspective. Nobody else has that. It's so weird that they're always like, lose that. Play for the masses. Nah, man, be the individual. So for me, I, you know, I, I just kind of got to the point where I'm like, individually, I could probably do stuff that doesn't require nearly as much uh, money, like making movies. Just do a podcast and go talk. out on shows, yeah, just talk yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Speaking of Kevin, something, I, I have a challenge for you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, let, me, let, me, let, me get to, let me get to Kempton's question. I got it. <laughs> Sure. Um, so I feel bummed, uh, Kevin, when you came to Calgary. A friend of mine got a ticket, but when I, I want to check it out, it's sold out. So oh, I want to ask you, uh, from, that, uh, from the Red State experience, uh, you want to turn it into a new distribution channel, new method and whatnot. And some people are saying, well, because you are Kevin Smith, you can yes. do it. And, and were you able to help other people and do you see other people successfully applying your, your techniques? Like, Absolutely. Is, is it just First off, anyone that tells you, oh, he could do it because he's Kevin Smith, mm -hmm. it's some horse shit, man. That's somebody who's trying to tell you 
don't try. You can't try. He did it. He could do it. You can't do it. Don't listen to that shit, man. That's everyone, think of life and progress as a game. As I always think of it in terms of game of hockey. When you're skating with a puck toward the net, man, there's always a motherfucker trying to hook you from behind just to slow you up <laughs> enough because nobody wants to see anybody succeed and stuff. So don't listen to that. When you hear somebody go like, well, of course he could do it. He's Kevin Smith. Those same assholes before I did it were like, it's never going to work. <laughs> Dumb. He's crazy. And then when it worked, the only thing, they, they didn't go like, you know what, we were wrong. And Instead, they say, well, only he could do it because he's Kevin Smith. And I say, horse shit. Kevin Smith wasn't always Kevin Smith. Nor is Kevin Smith the little kid that pulled a fucking sword from a stone. You know what I'm saying? Like, I came from nowhere. I came from parents that had access to nothing. And eventually got to a place where I could kind of do those things that I want to do. But I only did that, got to that place, just by playing it honestly and following the passion, not sheeping it up, doing the stuff you want to do. You stand out for that kind of thing. So don't listen to anybody that goes, oh, well, of course he could do it. I was not always Kevin Smith, and I'm still not sure I'm Kevin Smith. Okay. But I'll tell you right now, man, anybody could put this together. I had no ties whatsoever. Anyone could do this. That being said, we toured Red State. It was amazing. Great time. It was like going to church every time we had a performance because um, we did the Q&A after. Took it out ourselves, got rid of the middlemen, didn't do any commercials on TV, billboards, ads, or anything like that. Just pretty much advertised through podcasts or jumping on TV to do interviews or radio or something. Had such a good time, but learned how to tour a movie. Now, am I going to say, like, this is the only way it should ever be done forever? No, but you're always looking for alternatives because the old method doesn't so much work anymore. You can't just put up a commercial on TV and expect a bunch of people to show up and see it at the movie theater. They have too many choices. They just stay home and surf porn on the internet. Why would you want to go see the Avengers when you can watch, like, three people having sex from the privacy of your own home? <laughs> it's a whole desire, man. That's fun to me. So, you're competing for attention, and in a world where you're competing for attention, you have to figure out ways to make it more interesting for the audience to come out. It's no longer enough to be like, here's the movie, come see it. For some movies, Dark Knight Rises and, of course, The Avengers, it'll be like that. But for other movies, man, you've got to gild the lily a little bit. And in the case of Red State, we were like, look, you come out and see this movie, we'll be, I'll be there talking about it right afterwards, mm -hmm. we'll Q&A with you. So we're taking that model and applying it to this Jay and Silent Bob movie we're doing. It's called Jay and Silent Bob's Super Groovy Cartoon Movie, and it's mostly 2D animation, flash animation. And then the third act is live action. We put the suits back on and stuff like that. So we're making the movies like super cheap, almost not as cheap as, cheap as Clerks was, but very, very inexpensively. And then rather than just sell it to somebody who then piles on marketing, we're just going to take it out ourselves, same way we did Red State, and go way further than we did. Hit every state, hit theaters left and right, and, and it's just fun. You live on a bus, you hang out with your friends. After each screening, you do a Q&A, and you record that. It becomes a podcast. So... It's, it's, it's like going to, like, I mean, I guess, I, didn't, I never went to Coachella or anything like that, but I guess it's kind of like that. If instead of multiple acts, there's like one act. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the Grateful Dead, the more I think about it. we got a real deadhead type problem. Okay. i got okay. a question. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, being a fellow Jersey boy, I'm from Pensalkin, down oh, south wow. Jersey. Yeah, yeah so, south. But, uh, I, I've followed your movies for a long while. I've got most of them on DVD. I don't have them all. Uh, my, I love them all, but the favorite line is when you guys are when he's arguing about the Lord of the Rings, and he says, "Even the trees walked in this movie." <laughs> yeah. I love that line. I love that line. But I have a question: so Are you? I was so happy with writing that line, and I was so <laughs> nervous after I wrote it because I'm like, someone else is going to make this joke first. That's the other thing. When you're a screenwriter or something like that. You, you, you sit. Think, you think about that? Like of someone course. Else is gonna, oh, my God. You come up with something where you're like, this is gold. Nobody's ever said this before. It's tough to say something original. Mm -hmm. You come up with a joke that nobody else has ever done, and then you've got to worry that between the time you write it and the time it finally hits screens, somebody else might do it first. So it was like in Red State, I had a bunch of stuff in there where I'm like, three years it took us to find money for the movie. You're always worried somebody else might say something similar first or something like that. So with the podcast, you don't have to worry about it. Record it, put it up, it's done. It's like doing the news every day. It's like you do it, the next day it starts all over again. So I was always so happy about writing that line and so happy that nobody bit it beforehand or it didn't show up in a similar fashion. But that's the nerve-wracking thing about screenwriting is you'll put wonderful ideas into this the script of yours, and you have to in order for it to be noticed or for it to pop. You've got to play it 100% honestly, but then you've got to know that like, as you're waiting for that thing to reach fruition, hit the screen or whatever, there are a bunch of other people working just like you trying to say something original as well. That's why I like the immediacy of the podcast. I get it up, it's done. It's said. And if somebody says something similar down the road, you can be like, oh, yeah, we said that like three years ago. Yeah, you only get an original thought for like five seconds. Yeah. 
Yeah. Tom, did you answer your question, or did you get to ask the question? No, actually, that was just—I was just—I broke the chapstick out first. I got a uh, <laughs> the question. The, uh, the, well, the, the, the question. Good, I, no, no problem. Anytime. Uh, the, the question I actually had was: um, Are you still going to be doing the concert tours where you go around and talk to the colleges and stuff? Yeah, and will you be in the Atlanta area anytime soon? Well, when were we just were we in Atlanta recently? Where we're heading? Yeah. We're supposed to be. We uh, basically the place to go to is uh, we started doing so many live shows, man, that we have all these different websites. But the one we put together for the live shows is called Csmod, S E E S M O D dot com, and we list all the places that we're going to go. I know they just added Kentucky this morning for Hollywood is that Babylon. Right? Csmod dot com, yeah, yeah. That's the uh, basically you click on that, and they'll tell you everywhere where we're playing uh, across the country. I know we got stuff coming up uh, on the. We just did the. The West. We were just in mm -hmm. Texas like last week. We just got back from the UK a couple of weeks ago, and we head to Australia for a two-week tour in a couple of weeks. But between now and then, there's some shows domestically. I want to talk about your book, Lucy, because that's why you're here. Yes. I mean, your book is, you know, uh, advice for people, but your 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 musings, your take on life. But what is it about? That book? Yeah. That book is kind of like. Uh, it covers the last five years of my life, which creatively and personally was a pretty interesting time. If you're ever going to write a story about your life, try to pick the moments where the good shit's happening. Um, I didn't want to go back and just simply retell the clerk story because that was like a great thing that happened to me and stuff. But uh, I wanted to talk more about kind of what was happening recently and the changes and stuff like that and what it led to and more about just kind of like you can do this sort of thing. Um, so I started writing about the last five years. We touch on the beginning and whatnot because I have to give you the backstory of all the movies just in case you don't know who the hell I am and stuff. Uh, but generally, it's about what went on recently. So it's like, you know, me talking about working on Cop Outs. I talk about working with Bruce Willis. I talk about the Southwest thing when they're like, get off, get your fat ass mm -hmm. off the plane. Talk about my wife, talk about Gretzky, talk about everything that's going on. Red State gets like three chapters and whatnot, Zach and Miri. So it kind of uh, tells the story of how I got from there to here. And I figured. Rather than wait till I'm like, you know, 60, 50, whatever, and you start writing the memoirs, I'm going to forget most of the crap because I smoke a shit ton of weed. So I, for me, yeah, every morning, wake and bake, man. I have to. Uh, I believe I think that way. Um, so for me, it's, I'm like, I, I can't be guaranteed that when I'm 50, 60, I'll remember the details. I got a pretty good memory, but the details is what makes a story. So I'm like, while I'm fresh in the details, man, I might as well write it down. Now, nobody says you've got to wait until you're dying to write your memoirs and stuff. So I was like, let me give them a little section of memoir right here. You're not afraid to speak your mind. I mean, you. I don't think you, anybody you, should you, be, you, unless if not in America, if, like you if you're overseas regret, or if you're in a Muslim say, country, you got to be careful about what you say. But right, we live right. in the land of the free, the home of the brave. Nobody in this country should ever be afraid of expressing a thought or something like that. Have That's you what this country's about. Anything you've ever said at all? I mean, about certain. Yeah, people absolutely. I had a, one time. I had this like moment with Ben where I felt really Ben Affleck. I felt bad because this is early on when I was doing Q and A's and whatnot. Um, you know, I'd tell Ben stories. I use Ben as always a go-to punchline because, A, it's, it's easy because <laughs> he's a friend, and I know he's not going to be like, hey, you piece of shit, you know, and punch him. And, B, because, you know, it's, it's fun. He's very successful. The idea of going like of, of poking a Ben, uh, poking Ben Affleck in those moments is certainly not like, look at this loser. Ben is one of my favorite people on the planet, but he is kind of like my go-to guy, uh, you know, jokes and punchlines and stuff. And then one day we were shooting something. I forget what it was. And he was just, he mentioned something about the evening with. He was like, well, I'm sure this is going to wind up being a story where you make me look like a jackass in front of a thousand people. And I laughed, and I was like, yeah, right. And then it hit me that, like, there might have been a lot of truth in that statement. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, does that, does that bug you that I yeah. actually do that in front of people? And he goes, look how cute you are. It only occurred to you now. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely been some times where your, yeah. your storytelling has gotten me into trouble. And I was like... Oh, that's weird because I don't think about it as your life. It's something that happened to me. And he's like, yeah, but when you go tell people I put my balls on your neck, dude, how am I supposed to get over the ball? He's like, I see that story in the press. My wife comes up to me and goes, what happened? You know? So okay, I get it. There are moments like that where you're like, oh, man, I feel bad. But, you know, I don't know. It's tough to – you can't start putting on guards or, or kind of like, well, I'll only talk about this. I, I believe in full candor, particularly because everyone hypes and spins and sells – 
there's no truth anymore. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's always gloss and shit. And sometimes just be revolutionary. Just stand out there and be honest. Be like, yeah, I got a little dick and Bruce Willis hates me. And the other line threw me off a plane and stuff. And then uh, there's the reason that the next 20 things you say are going to be probably true as well, particularly if they're not nearly as intense. But you, when you live unguarded, man, when you clean out the closet of all the skeletons, nothing can live there. Nobody can get you if you put it all on Front Street. So I don't know. The only truth—that's what well, I think. Yeah. So, so what's the what's the deal with the hockey shirts? No, the hockey shirts for me is uh, is essentially fat guy moo moo. When I, I used to wear the the long <laughs> coat, the long coat was very much fat guy moo moo. Where it, it gives the illusion, particularly had nice lines in it. I'm from Hawaii, by the way. So you don't know. Well, know you know what the idea of a moo moo is. Absolutely. Um, so this thing is is uh, the coat used to work as that very well, but you know I live in Los Angeles, it's always like 70 degrees. Mm -hmm. You can't wear that coat everywhere. So I go through uniforms long periods of time. You'll see me wearing the same outfit for like three, four years straight. I went back to hockey jerseys uh, recently in the last few years. I would say the last three, four years. Um, maybe three years, two years actually. Because these are the, my lucky colors. These are the cor yeah. colors of the Edmonton mm -hmm. Oilers, particularly yeah. the dynasty. <laughs> yeah. So they became kind of like my, my lucky color. I mean, it's dope. Luck is a dopey thing. But for me, I'm like... Man, ever since I've been wearing them's colors, like things, good things have been happening. So naturally, I wear that. I get an outfit. I just kind of stick with it. The Einstein theory of pick an outfit, so you never have to sit there. And I'm no fashion plate. There's not a lot. Of, I can't buy off the rack. You know what no, I'm saying? You so actually, essentially, I made up a bunch of these. There are eight of these jerseys I swapped out. You lost a lot of weight. There was I a period did. where I still can't buy off the rack. What? Unless I go to like you know casual mail XL, so then what, I could buy. Off so the what rack. happened in that time period of, of your life? Like losing all that, what did you do? I, well, for, what happened was essentially I gained a bunch of weight after Southwest. Southwest like said he's fat, he's too fat for mm. a fucking plane, and they profiled me in line. And I was fat, but I was like not that fat, the fat that they're talking about and stuff. So after I went through that, if you literally look at what was going on at that time, like it was like two years ago, mm -hmm. the cop out premiere was like week a week after that too fat to fly. So there's pictures of me standing on a red carpet, and I look exactly like I look now. Clearly, I could fit in a Southwest seat, but they kind of profiled me and lied and buried me. That's what I, that's what bugged me about that whole thing. So after that, I start comfort eating. Once ever, what, like for three days, it was horrible, man. Top of Google News, people going fat director, fat guy thrown off plane, fat, 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 because I had written fat in my tweets, mm -hmm. so they can use it now to go back on you. Three days, man. I was like, life will never be the same. I'd wake up, I'd turn to my wife, she'd be already online. I was like, is it still there? She's like, oh, top God. of the page. Then God bless him. Tiger Woods came out, started talking about his fat wife. Nobody cared about my fat ass anymore, man. It was like the world discovered I was fat and then forgot about it because, like, this guy's having sex, you know. And so, about that. so once the eye of Sauron was off me, I comfort ate, man. I was just like, I'm so mm. depressed. And I just started putting on weight and stuff. So then... I lost weight after that, and people go, oh, good for you, you lost weight from the Southwest Incident. I'm like, no, I didn't. No, I gained weight because of the Southwest Incident. Then I had to take it back off. But I've always been that guy. I go up and, and down and whatnot. I'm not like somebody who's like, oh, medically I'm, I'm overweight or something like that. I Literally, I'm, I'm sedentary, and I eat crap food. You know, only now, midlife, am I trying to change my diet and the food I eat and stuff. And now I'm also trying, you know, when you... When you see less in front of you than yeah. behind, you start going, what did they tell me in phys ed? What should I be doing? You know, suddenly you're trying to play catch up. So now I exercise and eat a lot better now. But even good. given good. that, not as, better, as good as I should. Certainly not as good as you, yeah, Jesus kids, Christ. That's in the genes. I mean, part of it is in the genes. Yeah, that's true. my mom and dad. Hey, listen, who's got uh, Steven? Kevin? Kevin? Where's the, Sir. Oh. Kevin, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to be the first guy to produce something in this medium that we're in right now. There's, oh, there's 130 million people in Google Plus now. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be 500 million by the end of the year. This okay. is a novel space. I want to challenge you to produce something. You're doing podcasts, and that's cool. Yeah. This is really cool. Uh, look, I would do this Early. in a heartbeat. You know me. The idea of well, podcasting you're, you're is you can sit down with you don't. You're podcast. Podcast. I am. I am. Yeah, so so maybe I'll, I don't even know if this exists. I'll, maybe I'll yeah. start doing this in a reg. But the when you uh, when you kind of jump out there and and, and uh, have conversations mm -hmm. with people, mm -hmm. you, you suddenly you don't need talented people. Like when you're making movies, you're like, I need someone who can act. I need somebody who knows how to hold the camera and stuff like that. Conversation. You can talk to anybody, untalented people you could talk to, and they'll still give you great content. I sat down with my mother mm -hmm. and did podcasts with my mom, and granted, I found <laughs> some weed cake. I told her in advance. But, Are you being serious? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was amazing. Wow. Go listen to that podcast. Okay. It's fantastic. But I, would like, I could sit down. Like, look at all these cats. Mm -hmm. Like, right there, man. I could sit there, same thing, for an hour and just click and, and chit-chat. Like, you know, obviously, I like the sound of my own voice. You're going to do it. I can see mm -hmm. it coming. But I'll do, I, I accept that challenge, to sir. Your, uh, to your right. Steven, go ahead. You got, you got a question. Ming, create a hangout for me. That's our <laughs> web guy. 
who's not watching. Stephen, what part of Canada again? I, I... Stephen, um, you're muted. Uh, muted. 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 You're muted. Oh, man. Now we come press to you. Just Okay, Jane. Okay, I'll jump in um, because I'm already vaselined up as well to kiss your ass because I adore it. <laughs> I just adore it, and you have gorgeous hair. Oh, you're too, no, it's but, thinning. Watch this. No, but there you go. Oh. 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 All illusion. See artifice. This is Hollywood, right up front. A new place for, for Ben to oh. body parts. That's nice. Okay, what's your I, well, I've just, this is just so obscure. I, when people, women in particular, go, oh, you like Kevin Smith films? It's like, yeah, they're brilliant, and he's a great writer. I always go back to you telling the story about working for Prince. Yes. And I just come back to it over and over. I don't know why that stuck with me, but there your telling of working with Prince fascinated me. I there was that, a, yeah. I did. There was a documentary uh, years ago that... He had seen Dogman and he liked it. We were on Jay and Silent Bob Strike back at the time. Mm -hmm. And he, he uh, called up, well, his office called up, like, Prince is going to be calling in 10 minutes. I was like, right on, man. And then they call you every few minutes. Prince is going to be calling in five minutes. Like, lead you up to it. Yeah. And then it was finally him, and he was like, I saw Dogma. I liked it. I would like to make a movie uh, that's bold, uh, spiritually bold. He's going, I'm having a gathering up at Paisley Park for an album called The Rainbow Children, would you like to come out and shoot a documentary? I was like, oh my God, yeah. And so I went out there to shoot a documentary with him, and he was a little wacky. He wasn't like disappointing like Bruce Willis. He was just definitely a little wacky and whatnot. So we shot this documentary, uh, and it was like a bunch of his fans like hanging out, and they'd listen to the album, and then they'd chit-chat, and then he'd pop into the room, people would be like, Prince! And then he'd join the Q&A and stuff. So it was kind of fun. I didn't know what was going to happen in the footage. And then I was told, like, uh, while we were there, he was doing shows in St. Paul at the XL Center. I don't know if it's in Minneapolis or in St. Paul. Um, he was doing shows there, and people were like, hey, man, that footage you shot, he was putting up on the screen last night. And I was like, really? He was using it during the concert? That's kind of cool. Years later, I found out what eventually happened to the footage. It became part, pieces of it that I was told became parts of a recruitment film for the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> 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 Who knew, man? You know, I <laughs> Christ. I have no idea. Uh, Can you hear me now? We're getting the uh, the rap here, so oh. we're, we're going to... Uh, Can I have a thing quick thing? one, Kevin? So, uh, si since the Southwest uh, incident, um, you're, I love the fact that you talked to Natalie afterwards, but I want to ask you now, do you get a first-class treatment anytime you walk into an airline? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely, like, uh, I've, now there's a bit of a reputation in as much as, like, I'll get on a plane, and, and uh, the flight attendants will usually kind of look up and... Do this, and I always kind of give them. I will be no trouble, I promise you. And that makes them laugh. Just don't stuff. do an Alec Baldwin on them, right? Yeah, I was like, I don't play words with friends. No, 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 I just no. like, I like yeah. snacks. Hey, guys, snacks with friends. Thank, thank you, thanks for hanging out. I'm sure Kevin's gonna have his own Google Plus on air soon, so watch out for that. Yeah, thank I'll you do something so much. There. Check out spot.com for a, a list of dates and, and, and locations. So you can see wherever we're and your book, go. Tough Smith. Tough Smith. Tough, tough shit. Tough. We can say it's online. Look at you. You're such a book. Tough it. shit. <laughs> <laughs> I actually said it by mistake earlier. Did you? I, I heard somebody was just like, she could get fired today. I was like, don't. It's the title of a book. Thank you for anyway, that. Anyway, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Yeah, Google Play. Oh,